Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are watching this and listening. Welcome again to uh, a session in our educational webinar series. And today we're going to talk about resting state brain connectivity analysis with beta connectivity 2.0. Incidentally, uh, the 2.0 version has now also been released in Europe, so um, it is now available yeah, for everybody worldwide. <clears throat> and uh, today we're going to walk through some uh, hands-on analysis. So I would like to show you, um, first of all, some theoretical background on resting state brain connectivity analysis. Then uh, I would actually take you through a real data set today. So we're going to introduce the data set we're working with. We're going to have a look at what it means to work with source level connectivity. Uh, we'll in, employ some batch modes for fast and safe analysis, and we'll be able to directly compare different age groups of the resting state data set. Yeah, and finally, hopefully we're also going to get around do some statistical analysis, and then there's time for questions and feedback. So uh, let's start with uh, a little bit of theory, but today the theory is going to be quite short. We had, I think, one or two years ago, we had a webinar where we went into quite some depth of the theory behind the connectivity methods in BESA. So that's also available on our YouTube channel. Please uh, tap into that one if you're interested in more theoretical background. So now I'm just going to talk about the theory as it applies to our specific uh, analysis paradigm today. So first of all, we're looking at resting state data today. And resting state data does not actually follow a stimulus paradigm. We just record the brain while it rests. Uh, however, uh, in order to compute connectivity measures, we need some epoch data. Uh, the assumption that we're going to work with today is that, uh, in our case, the general brain connectivity is stable over the recording epoch that uh, we have. And uh, the approach we're using is we divide this recording into overlapping epochs of equal length. So we have a longer recording. And uh, like in this scheme here, we're going to look at, say, uh, two or four seconds epochs, and these will overlap with each other. So in this case, we have an artifact here, and we will remove that particular epoch because it contains an artifact, but the other ones uh, will still be sal salvageable and will enter the analysis. Yeah, and the... Um, Second thing about uh, theoretical background is what actually does connectivity mean? So uh, what we're looking at is a phase and or amplitude relationship between oscillations in different brain regions at a certain frequency. So uh, for example, you're looking at different, um, so virtual sensors, different positions in the brain, say this uh, right angular gyrus here, Imagine that it has some sort of oscillation that is active during some time. And maybe also the left anterior gyrus has some oscillations. And uh, then we can measure the phase and amplitude relationship between these. And if these are stable over a number of epochs that we compare, then we uh, talk about the connectivity between these two brain regions or these two virtual channels that we've measured. Yeah, and one thing we need in order to do this is um, a time frequency decomposition. So say you have uh, one epoch here, then you can uh, simply transform it into time frequency space. So you can see all these little channel symbols here and they all have, uh, you can see at the, at the occipital part of the head, you have some uh, stronger signal, which is the alpha rhythm and otherwise you don't have so much signal uh, in the other regions. <clears throat> and then another epoch will also be transformed. So all these epochs will be time frequency decomposed and then we can, con uh, we can figure out about connectivity between them. Yeah, so uh, one thing that we should take into account is uh, what we call volume conduction effects. So, um, 
we want to avoid these. So what are volume conduction effects? Well, imagine you have a source in the brain. Say, uh, this is a hypothetical scenario, but uh, imagine you have this source that uh, is situated in a um, fissure here. And uh, so if the, the current flows from um, posterior to anterior direction. And then you would end up with a topography of currents on your scalp surface that uh, has like, simultaneous activation of the occipital and the frontal part of the scalp at the same time. And if you then measure connectivity between these, um, there would be a lot of connectivity at uh, with zero phase lag. So uh, at the same time, these will be active, but not because these different brain regions are active, uh, simply because the current that's produced here in the brain will uh, propagate uh, over the scalp to very remote regions. And um, this is something, of course, we don't really like so much. So um, some measures then say, okay, we're just going to throw away our zero phase lag connectivities. We're just going to look at connectivities with a certain phase lag between them. This will then do away with our volume conduction artifacts. The problem with that, though, is that in resting state connectivity, um, other than in task-related experiments, maybe we are a bit interested also in zero phase lag. So what to do? Uh, one thing we can try is uh, apply a spatial filter. So instead of looking at the scalp connectivities, we transform the signal into the brain and uh, we reconstruct the activity from different locations in the brain that we're interest, interested in. So this is the uh, so-called uh, source montage concept in BESA that uh, we have a, like, a, like a montage, only that the montages are sources in the brain, the channels. Yeah, so if you look at that, uh, instead of uh, doing the scalp connectivity, we then calculate our connectivity between these source montage channels. And that then should uh, get rid of this volume conduction problem. So let's uh, move on. Uh, the third thing in our theoretical background is uh, thinking about what type of connectivity do we actually analyze. Uh, in this case, we are looking at connectivity of, in distant brain regions. We actually want to figure out uh, what's happening in the resting state. And the resting state is uh, famously um, activates the so-called default mode network, which is um, distributed over uh, various regions that are quite far apart from each other. So uh, we're looking at long-range connectivity with brain regions several centimeters apart. And that means that the frequencies that carry this um, long-range connectivity typically do not exceed low gamma and we don't need very high frequencies analyzed in this case. So one thing that that means is that we can actually downsample our data. So if you have a very high sampling rate, we can actually reduce it and this will really help us in terms of uh, storage and speed of analysis. So the analysis steps that we then will follow here are, um, first of all, looking at the raw data then selecting a source montage of interest that uh, we will work with, then define an ERP paradigm. Um, we're then gonna launch basal connectivity. And in basal connectivity, we are going to load these exported data, compute the time frequency transforms, and then finally, uh, the connectivities that we can um, kind of establish from these time frequency transforms. And uh, luckily, this can all be batched together, so we can actually make our lives a lot easier by uh, finding a right batch that does this first step, the pre-processing of data. And then also uh, now with Connectivity 2.0, we have the option of also batch processing the second part of the analysis, so um, uh, analyzing all the different data sets uh, in one go. And then finally, we would also be interested in statistics, so we would then have a look at what happens in the end. Uh, so what's actually relevant, which data connectivities may be significant or uh, maybe just spurious connectivity that is not really a stable uh, effect. Okay, and uh, we're gonna now work with a real data set. This data set was downloaded from the Open Neuro 
website. Uh, here's the link to the data set. Uh, the data set was kindly provided by Christopher Hartlestad Hall. And um, the data set is a resting state EEG that was extracted from an experimental paradigm um, in Norway. And it was recorded with a biosemi active tube system with 64 electrodes in 1020 system or 1010 partly. And we also um, have a high sampling rate of this data, which we'll see in a minute. Yeah, and all use of this data set in publications context uh, should then cite the following paper here. So please bear that in mind if you want to use it yourself. Um, and we are just going to use a subset for this tutorial here. So I'm not going to go through the full because there was like over 100 uh, participants and uh, this will just be too much for this relatively short webinar today. So instead, uh, we're going to work with 10 young subjects and 10 old subjects. So old means like my age and young is uh, people are still fit. So um, yeah. Uh, we have two two different groups, and uh, I would like to just look uh, into are there differences in resting state eyes closed connectivity between these groups, or is it both kind of the same thing? Yeah, and actually, um, there's a quite a similar study that I would like to mention here. Um, also, uh, the authors used uh, basic connectivity for some of the analysis, and uh, it was published last year uh, by Ricky Chow and others in um, Neuroscience. So maybe we could also have a look at that one if you are interested in that particular topic. <clears throat> okay, so let's now uh, stop presentation and instead I'm going to um, walk you through this whole analysis. The first thing is that we need to actually have a uh, look at our raw data. So I'm gonna open this data set and um, so yeah I've already kind of done a bit of um, work beforehand so I've sorted these two different age groups into two different folders and uh, here's one EDF file, uh, original data file, that um, contains one of the data subjects and you can see what the data looks like. So um, first of all, we should have a feel uh, for the data. Is there any really bad channels that I need to get rid of? Uh, is the data sort of generally okay to work with? So if I look, if I browse through this data with a space key, I can see that after a few eye blinks at the beginning, uh, the data is uh, eyes closed data set. And I can think, I think the data quality is okay, except maybe this channel here, uh, CZ, which seems to have some, uh, yeah, um, what you call it, um, network frequency on it. So uh, if I encounter any channels that I would like to not include in my analysis, I've got two options, so I can right click on the label and I can make it a bad channel or I can interpolate the channel. So if I think about, okay, first of all, yeah, it's always better to have more channels rather than fewer channels. So interpolating a channel is generally a good idea, um, but maybe not if the channel is right at the edge of the channel data set. So let's just have a look, press the V, the view button, and then um, we can select this channel and see where it is. So it's um, here at the very top of my uh, of the head, and we can see it's surrounded by a lot of other channels. So it can be safely interpolated rather than set to a bad channel. So if I, for example, look at a channel like this one, um, then um, I'll say maybe this one, they owe the P9, which has no neighbors, then it would be more difficult for the program to interpolate this signal. So in that case, you may think about making it a bad channel if it's got rogue signal. But I think for the CZ now, we can interpolate it and then uh, you can see that the net um, frequency disappears. Okay, so that's one thing. And the second thing is if I go to the uh, filter, 
um, EDF, the filter settings, I can see that the sampling rate for this data set and actually all the other ones is 1024 hertz. And we're actually only going to look at frequencies from maybe up to 40, 50 hertz. So uh, it's a lot of oversampling for what we really need to achieve. And I think in order to make our uh, life easier, the best thing is to downsample the data before we do any further analysis. And downsampling in BISA is super easy. You just use the batch. So there's a batch button here, the BAT. <clears throat> So we click the batch button um, and then we look for the right folder, which is the downsample folder. And I want to export this to a 250 hertz um, data set. Yeah, so what it's going to do is it will high pass no, it would low pass filter, so high cutoff filter the data with an 80 hertz frequency in order to ensure there's no uh, aliasing taking place when I downsample the data. And then this uh, filter data will be exported and resampled to 250 hertz. So let's run this batch. Okay, it's done and it has exported the data. I just need to find it, so I'm going to go and open this data set and now uh, it's no longer an EDF but it's now a um, focus format or BISA binary file format FOC format and the last modified one was this one so this is the one I just created and yeah the file names are big, like that because the data were anonymized by some algorithm so when I downloaded them the file names were already that long that's nothing I can do about it. So this is the downsampled file. And um, we need to check, yeah, the filters here are point, so let's, let's do the filter, do it point uh, five to 80. And also filter the original file so I can swap between downsampled and original file using the F plus, F minus, and filter this the same way. Point 0.5 to 80. And then I can sort of swap between them and I can, of course I should go back to the beginning of the other one as well. So otherwise it's not gonna be a fair comparison. So if I now compare these two, I can see that it's virtually the same signal except that uh, the high frequency noise is gone once I've done my downsampling. Okay, so that's the first step done. I've downsampled my data. Um, and because this is a bit of a boring step, I've already prepared the other uh, 19 data files in the same way so that we can move on a bit more quickly. And now I want to, on this data set, want to run the uh, export for BISA connectivity. So I can get these uh, epoch data samples, I can um, send them the connectivity so that we can crunch our numbers there. So how do I do this? Um, the first thing that I want to do is select the right montage to work on. So let me go to the montage editor, the EDM. That comes up here. And in the EDM, I can uh, see my current montage, which is the original recording, but I want to move to uh, a source montage. And particularly, I want to employ the DMN, the default mode network montage with additional noise sources. So this is what that montage looks like. Um, I can go through the channel. So we've got the uh, posterior cingulate cortex. We've got the medial um, prefrontal cortex. We've got uh, left angular and right angular gyrus. And we have left lateral temporal lobe and right lateral temporal lobe sources. And then we have a few other sources that are just there to collect other brain activity that's not part of the default mode network. 
but might still occur since the brain is just active the whole time, right? Yeah, so these are the so-called noise sources that um, noise in terms of, we're not interested in that signal right now um, in terms of the default mode network, but it's still signal that we need to model. Yeah, so and I can set this montage just clicking this um, leftmost toolbar icon here. And now I have transformed my data into the um, one, two, three, four, six DMN sources and a few noise sources. And you can see how it um, so works through the data set. So that's already quite nice. And the next thing uh, is that I want to epoch the data. So the epoching of data is done by uh, inserting triggers in regular uh, um, epochs. So um, this is done from the ERP menu. There's an insert triggers. And um, here I can decide uh, how do I want to insert my triggers for spectra analysis or for an FFT average. Uh, so in this case, I want to do a spectral analysis and I'm going to use a spacing of two seconds. Two seconds means uh, in the end, I'm going to have four second intervals. So that's going to give me a lot of options in terms of low frequency uh, data as well, if I'm interested in that. And here I can adjust the trigger code, but I'm just going to keep with the 401 and press OK. And now I can see that my triggers have been inserted. This 2000 is not the trigger number. This is the length of that epoch. I can change this in the options display and uncheck this internal trigger name. So now I can see my trigger code numbers 401. <clears throat> so that is one step. And now, of course, I, I'm going to, in the end, apply a batch to do all this on my data files. Uh, so for this, I need to save these uh, events for the triggers so I can load them into the other data files. So let me do this once. ERP, save events. All events will be saved and I'm going to save them to uh, my resting state demo folder. Mm. Call it epochs two sec or two seconds dot event file. Okay, that's done. Mm. And now I want to um, define my paradigm. So I want to uh, tell the program how to um, deal with these triggers. So I'm going to go to ERP, edit paradigm. And uh, there's no paradigm as such yet, but I can now create one. I'm going to call this condition, the rest condition. Uh, the rest condition is simply look at all the trigger codes of 401, insert. So in this case, I have 118 such events. And if I go to the epoch, I can see that it already has adjusted the averaging epoch such that it'll be in 50% overlap between epochs when I go through these. So each epoch will be from the trigger to two, minutes, two seconds before and two seconds after. So altogether a four second length. That's good. And in terms of filters, I want to make sure that I don't have any really slow drifts that then destroy, uh, uh, that make my signal go haywire. So I'm going to do a gentle 0.3 hertz uh, high pass filter or low cutoff filter and enable this both for scan and also for my averaging. Okay, and I think this is, uh, then I can jump to the coherence tab or I could, I could also, yeah, one thing I should do uh, is go to the artifact and run a scan and have a look at um, if there are any epochs that may be too rogue to be used in further processing. So the way this artifact scan works is that for each epoch, it'll figure out uh, the highest signal in each channel and then sort it by badness kind of thing. So the, the epochs with the highest signals are sorted to the right, the epochs with the lowest signals to the left. And here I can 
be the judge to uh, which epochs will be included and excluded from uh, further processing. Uh, and also the channels with the generally worst epochs are at the top and the ones with the best you know, with the lowest signal generally are at the bottom. So if I have any channels that are persistently bad, I can also drag down from the bot from the top and make these channels bad here. But um, I've already done this um, so in some pre-processing step before, so I've already interpolated over my one funny channel, so <clears throat> there's no real bad channels here. And if I go to the edge of something and, and I'm not sure is this an epoch with problematic epoch or not, I can right click and show the trial and then see if there's anything wrong with this epoch. So here we have a slight uh, rise, but it's not too bad. But if I go to the very right and show this trial, this now got a huge artifact. So this is better left out from the further analysis. Yeah, so this is the artifact scan. And then finally, I go to the coherence tab and um, just make sure that my target condition is set, that's fine. So let me go back to one of the other tabs and now I can save this paradigm. So I'm gonna save this as um, in the cognitive folder. Okay, um, and call it rest to sec or the two second epochs, and that's me. Now I've saved my paradigm, and I can use it for the batch later. And yeah, this is it. Now I wanna, um, yeah, I can maybe show as well how this will work. Now we do that in the batch now. So now I'm gonna build a batch that does these things and eventually exports everything for connectivity. Oh yeah, let me show this very quick. So, so if I didn't do a batch and I've already got my artifact, I could go to this coherence tab and then press the start connectivity button. You can see here in the regional sources, I have uh, a setting that will only use the radial orientation. So um, again, this will reduce our processing time. And radial orientation is the one that has the most local information maybe of the uh, sources. Um, if I want to do a exhaustive analysis of the brain regions, I would need to use all traces. So then for each of these brain regions, I would get three different traces, a radial one, a horizontal one, and a vertical one. Okay, but um, for this analysis, we are going to stick with the radial orientation that should actually cover, at least get something of um, the orientation that is, the, the activity that is in that brain region. So, um, good, and now I'm going to um, uh, write all this processing into a batch um, and so that we can run it on all our data sets. So, first of all, how to do this? I've got the batch button. If I just press it, I can run a batch on this one data set. But if I want to actually program a batch, I can shift-click on it, or I can also use process batch scripts is also uh, shift and R is also a shortcut or shift batch button. Yeah, and then, okay, let me first get rid of this old file here. Um, just delete it with a delete key. And uh, now I'm going to work with this file and also all the other files. So I'm going to um, add file. And I can see that here I have, uh, I can just shift mark all these other files this one i've already got and then open them and they should all have 64 channels and sampling rate of 250 hertz hopefully yeah and then i go to the batch and now I'll start adding a command for um looking uh, at processing these data so first step was to uh define the montage to work with. Double click on the montage. Here I can use the montage menu. In the source, I've got my resting state DMN. And okay, and now I've set my montage. Uh, then, uh, yeah, I remember I was gonna work with the radial option, so I can actually add that now. That uh, the montage should be, montage options should be uh, change to that I have my radial orientation of my channels. 
Okay, that's my second command. And then I need to define these epochs in the data. So I'm going to add a command to read the event file that I've just created. Event read. And oh yeah, now I need to find the, the actual place of this. Give me a second. So I need to browse to where my uh, where I saved this event file. Resting state demo. This is the one. So if I right click on this, I can copy as path and then I can paste that in here. Control V. Okay, so this is my event file. And this is now also defined. And now I need to apply the paradigm of my that uses these events. So paradigm. Um, and now I'm not going to use the paradigm of this file, but I'm going to use one that's defined for all the data files. So I'm going to browse to the paradigm folder, cognitive, and what was the last, this one, rest to sec, this is the one. That's okay. So that's my paradigm. Now I want to uh, scan for artifacts. So add command and artifact scan. And um, I'm going to wait after scan so I can actually adjust which epochs I'm going to take over into the further analysis. And finally, I'm going to um, export this these epochs to um, Beza connectivity. So um, yeah, I'm going to use the first condition. There's only one condition, so that's easy. Uh, and the target directory name, let me browse and I'm going to use this one. So I've created that already. So it's called demo rest h2230. Nothing in it yet. Um, that's my target directory. Press OK. My batch is done. And if I press OK now, the batch will run on all these 10 data files that I have loaded in the file list. So let's do this. First one, this is the one I already know. Um, so I already checked for the epochs here and we've got an amplitude and also a gradient criterion. So it's always worth checking both these criteria. Sometimes you have a, a gradient would be like a very quick oscillation in from one sample to the next that uh, shows some rogue signal and sometimes can uh, also cause bad trials. Yeah, so I can also exclude using this gradient criterion, but I think I'm good now. I press OK, then it uses the ones I've accepted, exports them, runs the next data set. Here, almost no issues. So keep going. Third data set. It's been loaded, it's been transformed to source analysis. You can see the epochs have been loaded and also this data set has very, very few problems so if i show a trial here you can see it's all quite nice so you just keep all the trials <clears throat> and go to the next one this one has a few more issues so i can drag this uh, over Let's see if there's any problems no this trial looks good so i can keep with this threshold i uh, can maybe exclude the first few gradient stuff and then go to the next one. And here as well, I've got hardly any problems. So very high percentage. You can always see the percentage of accepted trials up here. So it's um, a lot of trials are accepted. And here I've got one bad channel that I defined earlier when I did a kind of quick assessment of the raw data. And that's then been removed. But the good thing is that because I'm using not the original montage, but the source montage, uh, in the end, I'm still gonna have my 12 uh, source channels, even though one of the original channels is lost. 
Okay, and here, um, oh yeah, maybe this gradient stuff looks suspicious if it's got a very different color from the rest, so I'm gonna move this away and move on to the next one. And this also has a couple of bad channels. So of course, if I, if I did this like for a real paper publication, I would look into the data a bit more thoroughly, but now um, we can be quite happy with um, what the program suggests here to us and keep going. This one's fine. Okay, batch completed. So these were my 10, 20 to 30 files. And they've already now been prepared for connectivity. And now I'm going to do the same thing for my uh, 50 to 70 files. So um, I'm going to do shift batch um, add files. So I'm just going to go one folder up, one folder into here. Choose the prepared file. So I, I did the pre processing earlier, so I can open these uh, 10 data files. And go to the batch and load the previous batch. So this is the one uh, I did create earlier. And only thing I'm going to change is now change the target directory for my export. So instead of going to my demo rest age 20 to 30, I'm going to go to demo rest age 50 to 70. Okay. And I'm also going to save this batch in case I want to um, use it uh, later. And then press OK. And then we go through the, um, yeah, this procedure again. So we'll go through these 10 data files with the uh, artifact scan and that should only take a minute to complete this one's good as it is this one's also fine you can see there's often quite big differences in terms of quality so some have very very low signals some are very high signals and some artifacts in it so these are all good this one's also fine maybe here i should exclude a few more let's just have a look at one of these trials so you can see there's a little bit of gradient on these channels and high frequencies And here, take out a few more. So I'm already at file eight here, file nine. This one should also be excluded, I think. So move that over. And we're at the last one, file 10. Okay. Export is happening and the batch is completed. So now all the data have been prepared for Bezer connectivity. We can close Bezer research and go to Bezer connectivity. So now the next thing we want to do is uh, analyze these two groups in and uh, com uh, computer time frequency. Um, transformation which we then use to create the connectivity analysis uh, of these two different groups and the cool thing now is that a we now have a workflow based um, application here so it's uh, very easy to navigate through so on the right hand side I can interact with the workflow left hand side it shows me where I am in my workflow and in the middle I can see my results so let's first do the time frequency analysis and here I can now select what type of method I want to choose, uh, complex simulation, wavelet transform or multi-taper. I'm just going to do wavelet transform and here we have two options, Morley or Mexican hat. I'm going to use the Morley and we now want to use two conditions, my the young people and the old people. So we have the condition one, age 20 to 30 and the 
age 50 to 70. And go next. And now I can load the data. And I am um, by default, yeah, it'll already sort of suspect that I use this con export folder from Visa Research. Um, the one I configured in the batch was the first one was the demo rest H20 to 30. So you can see these were all just created a few minutes ago. And I can just press Control All to load all these data files into the workflow. So now I can see my number of trials and the different files and the actual file names of my files. And I've got 12 channels, which is my 12 source channels. And the same for the 50 to 70. So Control All for the 50 to 70 folder and load them and now I've already loaded them and then I go next and here in the next step I can review the data again so now I can see the averages of the different source channels and also the grand average on the left side uh, this is for the H20 to 30 here so I could go through and if there's one that's really really problematic I could um, potentially get rid of it and I could also um, go through the uh, different age groups and see what's the difference between the waveforms, uh, the average waveforms and the grand average waveforms of these different conditions. <clears throat> right, um, so that's just a quality thing. Then I can see here uh, where is my frequency range and I want to look at. So I just want to restrict myself to 1 hertz to 40 hertz for this. And uh, here's some wavelet parameters, especially the number of oscillations is important. Since um, I'm more interested in the frequency range rather than the time, the time is just a vehicle for me. I'm going to, in the end, not need the time information. Uh, I'm going to go with a higher number of oscillations. Five is good, I think. And then go next and run this time frequency analysis. And here I get a summary again of what I chose as parameters and now it runs analysis and you can see how it goes through the different data sets. So it sets all in all. But you can see here it's pretty fast proceed because on sampling and that's the crucial point. Otherwise this will take quite a long time now. Okay, and we are nearly there. Now it's just collecting final information for the final output. And by default, I can see uh, what's called the temporal spectral evolution in this plot, which is the change to the baseline. But since I don't really have a stimulus, this doesn't make sense. So I'm going to switch to the absolute amplitudes here. And then I can see uh, the amplitude over time. So average of all these epochs, of course, and um, and the different frequencies in the in the y-axis. So we can see some of the channels have very strong alpha range, and we can now see the 20 to 30 age group, but we can also switch to the 50 to 70 age group, and then uh, we see a slightly different picture. And yeah, and we can also go and uh, see the individual again. So we can go through each of these data sets uh, and sort of review the time frequency decomposition if we want to. But of course, I'm, I'm really interested in the connectivity. So this was just my vehicle to get to the connectivity analysis. So I'm going to finish this here. And now I can save my project. So yeah, I've got a group I can define. Um, I'm going to use the one that I already had because I practiced this a little bit. Um, so uh, I've got my resting state, open neuro, and I'm just going to call it demo. Um, but it's always good to know what is in this project. So let's call it demo, two groups, um, uh, 10 subjects, wavelets, three parameters, three, five, one to 40 hertz. And then I'll know if I ever come across it again, what type of project I had there. Okay, it's saved. 
next step now is connectivity. So connectivity analysis. And here I have now an, a choice of different methods I could look at. So I think I'm going to stick with um, three methods. So I'm going to look at phase locking value, um, then also the um, phase lag index and the weighted phase lag index. So these three I'm going to look at and let's go and run the analysis for these three methods. And uh, I can now choose my time frequency project that I have selected earlier. And of course, it's the one that I just saved that's already been pre-populated. And I just get a quick overview again of my time frequency data here. Yes, uh, I know that already, and I know this already. So this is my, this is my time frequency results. And now I go next, and now I can finally done my do my connectivity analysis. And these methods are also quite quick to compute. Um, the ones that take a long time to compute are the Granger causality based methods. Um, so these Granger causality would look into if some brain region drives another brain region in a statistical manner. But um, yeah, for these methods that I've chosen, computation is pretty fast and it's now already almost done. Here we are. And now we get a view of, my, of all the channels with all the other channels of my um, phase locking value, first of all, the grand average of my age group 20 to 30. And I can, first of all, hide the diagonal because the diagonal is just the self-spectrum of the channels. And I'm more interested in what channel-to-channel -channel relationships are. And the first six channels here are my, let me scale up a bit. Um, uh, first six channels are my uh, channels of interest of the DMN. We can also see which ones are selected here on the right. Um, the other ones are the noise channels. So the most important part of this matrix is for us the, the first left quarter, left upper quarter here. I can also zoom this a bit. Um, and I can now average over the time because now I've uh, computed all these phase relationships over these time frequency results. I, I can throw away the time. The time was just my vehicle to figure out what the phases between the oscillations are. I've got this now. Now I'm only interested in the general connectivity in my resting state epoch between these channels. So I can average over the time and I can go from say just the second half because um, because I've got these overlapping epochs, first and the second half should now be more or less the same thing. And now I get just a plot over my frequencies of my connectivities. And this becomes quite interesting because I can see for example, these channels here, LAG to RAG, they have a clear peak at the around about 10 hertz. And have a look at the, the actual value. So we've got about 0 0.3 here, so which is higher than all the other connectivities. So if I put my frequency ruler here to 10 hertz and then go to the 3D view, I can explore this a bit more. Um, I can turn it around. I can shift control and zoom it and change my threshold. So let me go to 0.3. And now I can see how these uh, regions are connected. So I've got a pretty strong left to right angular gyrus here for the 10 hertz. And I've got a connectivity between my medial prefrontal to the P posterior. So a real nice uh, network in the default mode network uh, playing out here. And I can change my um, sort of frequency ruler and see how the uh, connectivity adapts. So you can see that in different frequencies, there's actually different types of connections that are more important and come up and down. So let me go back to my... Um, 10 hertz, 
And uh, also I can now compare the different groups. So I can go and see, so this is my age 20 to 30. How about my age 50 to 70? Is that, is that the same? And we can see, no, it's not exactly the same. It's actually quite a bit lower. So there's no longer, the threshold of 0.3 here is no longer surpassed by the um, 50 to 70 for the LAG to RAG. And um, it's just a different connectivity compared to the 20 to 30 age group. So let's bear that in mind and maybe have a quick look at the other methods uh, that we computed. So the phase lag index, uh, let me go back. Okay, we can't see anything here. So let's go back to the TFC view and see where the phase lag index is stronger. First of all, it's got less amplitude. We need to scale up a bit. And um, if I look to the PCC here, yeah, I can see there's a peak there and it's in that bit higher frequency. Yeah, it's between maybe 10.6 to 12 hertz. And if I change my age group again, I can see it's quite interesting that the, the frequency shifts. So I've still got this connectivity, but it's at a slightly lower frequency. So obviously there seems to be some sort of slowing of alpha or of DMN connectivity frequency between the 20 and 50 age group. So also something that is quite interesting. Yeah, and then um, let's go last method I want to look at is the weighted phase lag index. And here you can see similar thing. So I've got my 50 to 70 and yeah, I've also got this shift, but it's not quite as pronounced maybe, but still there. Definitely, uh, you can see how frequency slows down. <clears throat> Yeah, and one last thing I want to show you about this is uh, we can also average over frequency. So if we want to look at not just uh, one particular frequency, but maybe a range of frequencies, then we can also check this box. And then we can say, what about if I want to look just anything between 8 and 12 hertz? Then I can see this tile, uh, these tilings. So uh, the tiles show me the the medium, uh, the mean connectivity in my time frequency range that I have selected with these uh, range, um, yeah, with these buttons here. And I can see the same then in the 3D view, and also in the circular graph view. If I but then I need to adjust the threshold, then I can also see what's going on there. Okay, so that's cool. So I have found some differences with between my um, my two groups, but are these significant differences? Are these will these hold over a statistical evaluation, or is this just some chance thing that's maybe within the statistical noise? So that's always something that is important to figure out, and uh, this brings in our last um, piece of the jigsaw, which is the business statistics. And how are we going to get a statistical uh, evaluation of this? Simply by exporting our project results. Um, and I'm just going to put it into resting state two groups. Select this as my export folder. And now all my connectivity data from the two groups, all the different subjects, all the different methods that I've uh, selected will be automatically sorted into subfolders in the export folder that I've just chosen. And then I can neatly pick them up in the basic statistics and directly compute if there's any significances. So uh, this takes actually a little bit of time, but now it should be done. So let me finish this project and save it for a future reference. And again, I should give it some meaningful name, demo. Um, two groups, um, three connectivity measures, and wavelets, one to 40 hertz. And then I can uh, close my connectivity program. And the last one I need to employ now is the statistics. And what type of test do I want to do? Uh, I'm going to do a t-test so because I've got two groups and I want to just figure out is there any statistical significance uh, differences between these two age groups. So 
start my t-test and I've got a range of options here um, the one I'm going to choose is connectivity start my workflow and now I need to change uh, the type of test because uh, I can I have to do an unpair t-test because I had different subjects doing uh, this resting state so there's no pairing between subjects. Uh, I'm going to use a two-tailed because I cannot a priori say that one should be stronger connected than the other, although I've got a suspicion, but um, let's leave it unbiased. And now I can load the data for the group one. My group one, I'm going to name age 20 to 30, and the condition is resting 20 to 30. Also. Okay, and where's my data? So uh, I had my two groups. That's where I exported my data, and it should be a, yeah. There's a date of today here. That's what I'm using. And now you can see how this data is uh, organized. That was exported. So I've got three different methods. So let's go for the base lag index. Oh, sorry, base lag index. Uh, then if I had different time frequency transforms, there would be several subfolders. But I've only got wavelet. And now I've got my two age groups, age 20 to 30 is first, and then again, control A, open. Now it's loading the data. And load the data for the next group. This is my age 50 to 70. Okay. Go up, go over, and control A, open. <clears throat> So these are the files for my second group. And now I can go to the next step in the workflow. I can run the preliminary t-test. And see what the result is. Here we are. So my preliminary test shows some stuff going on here and some here but of course we still got this time dimension here this is what i don't really need so i can first of all use just the second part of the epoch since again they were always overlapping um, and i can average over time for my further analysis so that i only get one average statistical value for my final um, results and here the I'm going to just stick with the standard parameters. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the basic statistics, but uh, we use a cluster permutation statistics uh, approach. That means that um, we first use the initial significance value that we can uh, choose here to build clusters that can extend over time and uh, frequency. Uh, and then uh, we build a new uh, statistical um, how do you say, um, distribution using uh, random permutations of all our subjects so that we build our own statistics and this is then corrected for multiple testing and is also independent of any uh, other bias. So quite powerful and also been published many times already and we now already have the final result and uh, we see that some clusters have been found indeed and uh, also that none of these really reach a p-value of 0 0.05 which we would consider significant um, but you have to remember that we only had 10 subjects in each group so I think if I use the whole lot I'm pretty sure that we'll, I would end up with some significant differences so let's anyway see what the clusters are so first one here is um, a noise to noise channel so um, the left and right occipital channels so that means that these occipital channels differ between the young and age young and older age groups at a frequency range between 9 and 12 hertz that's the first cluster that was identified and this is the same just the other direction from right to left and then we have a third cluster here um, that shows 
a significance um, between the left and right occipital, um, yeah, occipital and uh, frontal channel, and another one that then involves the uh, right angular gyrus and the uh, one of the noise um, channels again. So yeah, so here we cannot right now see any particular significance of the um, um, PLI values, but uh, we can still see if we look at the T values that there are that there are certain differences also in our um, channels. They just didn't reach a significance level here, but um, I think this is just a question of that we didn't have enough subjects to really push this through. So um, basically this was just to show you the um, pipeline and how we think it's, it's very, very easy to walk through an automated analysis of um, a large number of data sets. The last thing I can maybe show you is that you also get um, in the exported folder, it was in my documents, BESA 7.1 results folder here. That's where my resting state two groups is. You can see the project settings. So anything that was done on the data is exactly documented here. So um, you will never wonder, oh, what did I actually do in my experiment settings? But you can quickly put, look it up here. This is exactly all the settings that were applied to the data um, that uh, were put there. Cool, so that brings me back to my final slide. And I just wanted to thank the scientific contributors who made all this possible. So in terms of creating the source montages, uh, Michael Shark, who's kind of the inventor, Nicole Ille, Isabella, Paul Jordanov, who implemented the um, one for the DMN, um, Patrick Burke and Dieter Wechester, who did a lot of work, and for connectivity, Robert Spangler and Jayon Cho, who um, were instrumental in implementing all these different methods, and for statistics, uh, Isabella Paul Jordanov and Toda Jordanov, who were instrumental in um, bringing all these permutation statistics together. And if there's no questions, then uh, I would really like to thank you for uh, following me through this analysis pipeline. And I wish you a very happy holiday. And hopefully see you all in the new year and stay healthy. Thank you and bye for now.